Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to John 12 with me? John 12. In John 12, we see the triumphal entry being the Passion Week. And this, this story, the triumphal entry, is also um, in, all, in, all, it's in all four of the Gospels. It's in the other three as well as John. Um, super important story. And it's, it's beautiful. And I think the reason it's in all the Gospels and, and the reason it's part of Passion Week is because of the things that are engaged in this story, the things that are part of this story. And um, let's read it, and then we'll start talking about it. We're going to go from verse 12. This is John 12, verse 12. It says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. I didn't shout that as loud as they probably did. Hosanna! In case anybody was asleep. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Verse 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. I probably would too. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I want to talk this morning about, uh, about worship. One of the focal points of this, of this story and one of the reasons I think it's so important is the extravagant display of worship that was, was given as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, as he was coming into his destiny. And, uh, you know, worship is one of those things. I'll probably take a couple Sundays. We'll do Easter next week, but after that, you know, talk about worship. It's one of those things where, you know, there's lots of opinions, there's lots of thoughts about worship and what worship looks like. We know worship is more than the half an hour on a Sunday morning that we do music and we do song. We know that worship is a lifestyle and it's expressed in many forms. It's expressed in, in, uh, in acts, in deeds. It's expressed in word. It's expressed in song. It's expressed in so many ways. It's even just expressed at the very core in your heart towards the Lord. Just the position of thankfulness and gratitude towards the Lord. And, you know, we want to have a culture of worship. We, we want to be a house that loves to worship the Lord, that loves to be in worship, that loves, um, you know, the, the presence of God that is manifested in that, in that worship setting. So I want to look through this passage of Scripture with, uh, with worship in mind. One of my favorite verses on worship is Psalm 22, 3, where it gives the idea that he inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises, the worship of his people. You know, there are times that we may come and, and sit in a service and think, you know, this is, this is simply a song service. It's simply about playing some music and singing some words. And sometimes we can look at worship and think, you know, is this, is this frivolous? Is anything actually happening? And yet worship, praise and worship, life worship involves uh, so many deep realities. It involves engagement in the presence of God, the manifest presence of God being available in a, in a worship culture, in a worship setting. You know, when Jesus is talking to the, the woman at the well, uh, he talks about worshipers that would worship in spirit and in truth. 
as if he'd seen worship in other ways or if as, as if he'd, he'd seen or experienced people's worship that wasn't in spirit and in truth. And so there's this element of being able to come with our heart positioned, fully open, fully positioned towards the Lord to worship in this manner, in spirit and in truth. And even in that story, you know, worship is highlighted as he's talking to the woman at the well. And in this story, you know, worship is, is highlighted. Worship provides the manifest presence of God that transforms us and transforms situations. It is not a frivolous act. It is not just a song service. Worship is so full of purpose and intentionality. You know, the realities of heaven are tangibly present in a culture of worship because wherever he is, his kingdom is. Wherever the, the manifest king is, his kingdom is available. We often wonder, you know, what's heaven going to be like? There, there are glimpses and pictures of, of heaven and what it's going to be like in here, but some of the, the pictures we have are, are of worship, of unending worship, of this 24-7 worship, you know, service that is going on. And when we worship in spirit and in truth, when we come and posture ourselves before the Lord and engage with Him in authentic thanksgiving and gratitude, right, He inhabits the praises of His people. So the King, the King is manifested in that setting, but it also means that heaven is manifested in that setting. What's happening is that we're actually joining with what's going on in heaven, and that's when heaven starts to invade earth. And that's the prayer that He asked us to pray. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And one of the main ways that that happens is when we engage in worship in spirit and in truth. It changes the culture. It changes the atmosphere. Heaven invades earth and it takes situations that are impossible and makes them possible. Because the God of the possible is manifest. He's welcomed. He's, he's allowed to be present and he's honored for who he is. And heaven comes to earth. That's the power of an extravagant worship culture. Does that sound like something we want? Absolutely. A few of us. Okay. We'll have a special meeting tomorrow night for those that are, uh, that are all in for that. <laughs> Let me make this comment. The spirit of religion is, is ugly. And, and what religion will tell you, this is a mindset I've seen in, uh, in churches I've been in. What religion will tell you is, you know, I'm going to worship God, but I don't want anything in return. You know, I, I, I don't want to be blessed for my worship to the Lord. I'm just going to bring a sacrifice of praise, and I'm going to leave it with Him, and we're just going to honor Him, because it's not about getting anything. Yet, if the Bible tells us that He inhabits the praises of His people because God loves us so much that He wants to engage with us, and when we set our focus on Him, He's more than happy to engage with us because, because He loves the heart fellowship. He loves the union that we're in, and He wants to minister to us and shower His love upon us. And so, you know, that, that religious thinking sounds noble, but it's incorrect. And what I've seen is people come and say, I'm just going to worship the Lord. I don't want anything in response. And they actually resist God's presence and they resist what God wants to do in their life, what he wants to speak. But I know that's not this church. So I just brought that point up for other churches <laughs> in other places that aren't here. We can't help but enjoy the union with God in that place of, of worship. So let's, let's look at this story. I love that, and I think it's really intentional. I love that here's Jesus the, the week before the cross, entering Passion Week, 
and he's coming into the, the fullness of his manifest destiny. He's heading towards the cross, and this is, this is the time he's coming into Jerusalem, the city in which, you know, this is all going to take place. He's coming into his manifest destiny, but the way he comes into his destiny is in this absolute culture and atmosphere of extravagant worship, of extravagant praise. And I, I just, I love the surrounding of this culture because he's obviously worthy of it all. But it's also in this uh, extravagant worship culture that destiny is birthed. You'll find that in times of worship, there is vision and there are things that are released into our being that give us direction. God illuminates things as we honor him and worship him with thanksgiving and gratitude. He illuminates things and destinies become clear and he deposits vision in people's lives and and there's, there's things that, that happen in this kind of culture. And Jesus is coming into Jerusalem in this atmosphere of, of praise and worship. He's coming into the city surrounded by shouting, by praise, and by the acts of the palm branches and the cloaks that are laid down. In verse 13, what we see is the, the worship that they're shouting. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. What they're affirming, and, and there are actually different names in, uh, in, the, in the different Gospels. If you read all four, you'll see them shouting different names. But what you see is that these are all aspects of God's nature. They're all aspects of His character. And what these people are doing in this worship culture is they're affirming who God is. I can tell you that there is a revelation of who God is when we worship Him. When the manifest presence, if He inhabits the praises of His people, there is a revealing that happens when there is worship in spirit and in truth. There is a revealing of who He is. But the, the, the alternative or the other way is also true, that when He reveals who He is, we can't help but worship Him. I really believe if the world could see him as he really is, that he's irresistible, that nobody could resist him. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Well, how's that going to happen? It's only going to happen when people see him as he really is and realize he is worthy to be praised. The things that I've been praising, the things that I've been worshiping, they're not worthy at all. He's the only one worthy of all the affection and all the attention of my life. I heard someone say one time, whatever vies for your attention will vie for your affection. They saw Jesus as he really was and worshiped him, affirming his nature and his character. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess simply by the revelation of who Jesus is when he is fully seen. And one of the ways the church makes him fully seen is to engage in spirit and in truth worship in such a way that the manifest presence is so rich and it's so thick. I've, I've told you this before, but one of my favorite passages and my vision for, <laughs> for what I want church to look like is when the cloud filled the temple and the priests could not perform their service. I'd love a Sunday off. <laughs> Imagine the atmosphere of worship and praise that would have happened. That the presence of the Lord, I'm not talking about smoke machines that the presence of the Lord was so strong and so the manifest presence of God was so tangible that, a, that an actual cloud filled the temple, that smoke filled the temple. And the priests took a day off. Worship the Lord. <laughs> that verse has to find its way in our visionary document somewhere. <laughs> There's something that happens when we recognize God for who He is. 
but it's next level when we start to declare it and praise Him for it. see God for who He is, but when that expression starts to come out of our life with shouts, with song, with hands raised, with, with actions, with deeds, it changes cultures and atmospheres. It releases heaven on earth. You don't have to be sad about that, dear. It's a good thing. I want to look very quickly at, at at one of the names that they used. We sang it today without anybody knowing I was going to speak on this, but Hosanna, that term Hosanna means save. It means save. Jesus was recognized as the Savior. They shouted his name, save, right, to save, save us. You are the Savior. He was recognized as, as the Savior. There was a recognition of, of who he was and what his destiny was and what he came to do. They recognized his worth as the Savior and, and what it would mean and the relief that it would bring people. And I'm telling you today, there is a relief in salvation that is for your spirit, for your soul, for your body. There is a relief in the sozo of God that he is the Savior. There is a peace of God that passes understanding that will guard your heart and mind. There is a joy unspeakable and full of glory that explodes from salvation in you. Salvation is not just punching your ticket for a later date. That's part of it, but that's not the focus. Escapism isn't the focus when he said, I want to see heaven on earth right now. There is a sozo for you to live in, a salvation that will absolutely transform who you are, minister to every part of your being. They recognized him as Savior, that they'd been under this oppression and the the rule of the Pharisees and, and religion running rampant, and they were so excited for the Savior to come and make a difference. They recognized his worth, and we worship God because he is worthy. We worship God because of all his incredible characteristics. But there are times, and you may be able to identify with this, there are times that, you know, sometimes we don't feel like worship. You know, so maybe we haven't experienced the fullness of the sozo that is within us. Maybe the love, the joy, the peace isn't there in the measure. That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation. You can take the incredible gift that's been deposited in you and you can experience it through faith and all the measures of it. And we mature in our faith in this and the experience of it all. There are burdens you don't have to carry today. There's bitterness you don't have to hold on to. There are all these things that salvation has accomplished for you, but we don't always live in it. And sometimes when we're not experiencing the fullness of that sozo, we just don't feel very worshipful. The truth is, is that you've been given the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind. And if you're not experiencing the fullness of that, you still have a reason to worship. Salvation is not a gift that gets weaker or dwanes. It's, it's not a gift that God takes back. It's a gift that is in your life that was always meant to increase over and over, to pour over your life every single day, to take care of every worry, every stress, every anxiety. But sometimes we just allow thoughts and feelings and things like that to get in the way. And then we just don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes we forget his benefits and a lack of thankfulness and gratitude is expressed instead of passionate worship. David said this in Psalm 51, verse 12, and I, I find it very interesting. He said, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He didn't say restore unto me salvation because it wasn't taken. It's not something that's taken. But one of the benefits, one of the expressions, the joy of salvation, David apparently lost. And he didn't say, give me the joy of your, he said, restore it. Why? Because he had it, because it's part of salvation. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. There, 
We carry salvation. We have it. It's ours. When Jesus said, it is finished, I believed him. The finished work is a finished work. Salvation's been completed. You have it. But there are times that these feelings and thoughts dwindle in our experience of the salvation that God has given us isn't there. So David says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. How much of the church today do you think lives in this place where we've been given the greatest gift that has ever been given to mankind? I think Paul says, thank God for this indescribable gift. It's so good. He, he doesn't even have all the words to be able to describe how wonderful it is. And yet we live in this manner where parts of it seem unrealized. There's an encouragement today that goodness and mercy are, are chasing you down. That the fullness of salvation, you've got it. We're maturing into the expression of it all and the experience of it all. You have everything you need. You have salvation and you have him the king of the universe living inside of you. Even if your life looks like Job's. I know at some point in time, most people <laughs> look at Job and say, I know how you feel, brother. Even if your life feels like Job's, you always have salvation and the blessing of God living inside of you. In our North American culture, things want to steal our attention and therefore steal our affection. There are a lot of things to look at. And when our heart drifts away sometimes and attaches to other things, we start to experience the void. The place where salvation was supposed to fill. We have these feelings of being dissatisfied because the earthly thing has fallen apart or it hasn't come through. But there is a salvation that is yours, that is inside of you, that we can participate in and experience every day of our lives. Let's just look at a couple more points. In verse 17, it says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. And then it says, Many people, many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. I want you to know today that God is revealed in the supernatural. That crowds gathered because they heard of the manifestation of God's heart in a supernatural way. They heard of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Now, if you heard of somebody doing that, wouldn't you go out to meet them? Wouldn't you go out to say, wow, you know, I, I want to hear this testimony firsthand. I want to see the person that was raised from the dead. God is revealed in the supernatural. And, and this, this, this verse talks about how the people gathered because of a manifestation of God. Because God expressed himself. Because heaven touched down in earth. And remember, worship brings that culture of heaven to earth. Worship has the atmosphere, worship in spirit and in truth, that extravagant thanksgiving and gratitude brings heaven to earth. And in that, somebody was raised from the dead. And in that, crowds started to gather. Crowds started to gather to see Jesus, to see him revealed, to learn about him and know about him. Signs, wonders, miracles, healing, prophetic words, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, the expression of the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit that aren't opposed to each other, those expressions of heaven touching earth create a worship culture and reveal the King. This is why power evangelism can be so effective. And this is why the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest that ever lived, said, my preaching wasn't with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's why the Bible says that we will go make disciples, preach the word with signs following. Worship can bring in the demonstration 
of the God we know in the Bible, the manifestation of who he is and what he can do. You know, you can reason and argue doctrine with unbelievers, but when someone is healed of incurable cancer, it's evident that God is real. You can reason and argue. You can bring your argument to the table and the other person can argue back. But as long as it stays a mental exercise and a mental argument, there may not be the manifestation like this of God in the midst. Signs following, demonstration of the power of God. Praise and worship elicits the manifest presence and that creates an atmosphere for anything to happen for the impossible to become possible. It provides God the platform and the opportunity to manifest his supernatural nature, to manifest his love, joy, and peace, to manifest his goodness. The Bible was always a book written to lead us into experience because God is a person. He's not an ideology. He's not a a thought. He's not a method. He's a person. The Bible was written to lead us into an encounter and experience with the author itself. Two more quick points. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Religion will always be an enemy of authentic worship. The spirit of religion will always want to dumb down and calm down the fire and calm down the passion. Yet we've got pictures of like the woman at the well who encounters Jesus. Her life is transformed and she runs through the city telling everybody about Jesus. Religion wants to take your passionate worship, your hands raised, your dancing, wants to dumb it down and make it mundane and ordinary. Religion will tell you that you're embarrassing yourself. I have yet to see an expression like how David danced. I only ask if that comes upon you to please keep your clothes on. But there is an expression, an extravagant expression for the person that encounters and sees Jesus as he really is. A place in which it doesn't matter what people think, you just can't help but worship the Lord. Religion, you are not welcome here. Spirit of religion, you are not welcome here. This is a house for extravagant expressions of worship. The all-out worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he deserves it. I love this, the Pharisees. See, this is getting us nowhere. (laughs) There are things that we are equipped for that will silence the mouth of religion. There are ways in which we can manifest the king and his kingdom that will silence the spirit of religion. Where religion has no place. Where it has no room because of the authentic, extravagant worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I I love this. They go on to say, look how the whole world has gone after him. When God is extravagantly worshipped, the whole world is drawn towards him. You know, this is a season of harvest, and it's important that we engage it's important that we engage, that we go out to the highways and the byways. It's, it's important that we do those things. But there's a time coming that is upon us in which people will run to the light of the world and say, what must I do to be saved? When the Bible talks about us being a city on a hill, it's really hard to pick up a city and move it somewhere else. A city on a hill. Are we to go? Absolutely. But they're also to come. Both are going to happen. But I think we're going to see an increase of people running towards the tower of the Lord 
The name of the Lord is a strong tower. I, I see people running towards the church in the earth when we express him fully, when he is fully revealed. Nobody can resist him. And I see people coming and saying, what must I do to be saved? When that authentic worship explodes and the manifest presence of God is there, they'll be saying, look how the whole world has gone after him. There must have been an expression that would cause them to say the whole world. They didn't just say, look at how that group's gone after him. Look at how this city's gone after him. There must have been something happening in that day when God in the flesh, the Word becoming flesh, when Jesus himself walked the earth, there must have been something that, that gave them the picture that the whole world is turning to Jesus. The whole world is going after him, and so should they, because he is worthy. I believe that a culture of extravagant worship will change the world. If, if there's, <laughs> follow this thought, I just thought of it this morning. If, if there's 24-7 worship going on in heaven, where's time for the sermon? I'm almost offended. <laughs> I love to preach. I love to share the word. But worship, I've said many times, I'd love to just come and worship all morning, worship all afternoon, just give extravagant displays of worship, of thanksgiving and gratitude to the king. Here's the last point this morning. John's gospel didn't describe this part, but I pulled it out of Matthew's, um, Matthew's gospel. In Matthew 21, 8, it says this, a very large crowd sp spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And I want to talk very quickly about this representation of the cloak, and then, then we'll end this morning but this representation of the cloak. And so I started to look around and, and think, you know, what, what does it mean that they took off their cloaks and they, they positioned them on the ground under Jesus? And it even says that the disciples took their cloaks off and put it on the donkey that Jesus would sit on. And there was this, um, you know, we know there's lots of symbolism in the Bible and we see the cloak throughout the Bible. And the, the first thing I thought of was the... Um, was the Elijah, Elisha situation in which the cloak carried incredible representation. The cloak that Elijah bore was actually one of the focal points of the transition of the mantle being passed. And in, in that story, the cloak represented mission. It represented purpose. It represented who God had created you to be in your influence in the world. It, it represented the anointing and the mantle upon your life. And if we were to equate that with this story, it's like there was an expression of worship that said, I, I lay that down. You know, I'd, the mission you've given me, God, it's your mission. It's not my mission. You're, you're using me, but it, it's always all about you. My life's purpose is not to promote myself. It's to represent Jesus and to glorify Him. And it's like there was this incredible, extravagant act of worship in which they said, you know, our, our mission, our vision, our purpose, God, our significance in life, which you've called us to, we just want to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. In Romans 13, it talks about clothing yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, but the verse before says this, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Instead, verse 14 says, instead, so it's, it's making a comparison. Instead of this, 
it says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's like saying, the way I've lived, the behaviors, my heart attitudes, these things that have manifested out of my life, I take them off and I lay them down. And I want to clothe myself with the Lord Jesus Christ so that the fruit of my life will represent him. This incredible symbolism of giving up these areas of our lives and saying, I just want to be a yielded vessel and bear it all to him. Let me give you one last picture. It's the picture of the prodigal son, the picture of the lost son in the story of Luke 15. We know what he does. He runs off, finds himself in the pig pen, longing to fill his belly with the pods that the pigs are eating. It says he comes to his senses and he runs back to his father and his father welcomes him with open arms. And then what his father does is he places all these identity markers on his son, the ring, the robe, the sandals, and the fattened calf. The robe, the cloak, was an identity marker of whose we are. It was an identity marker to say, you know, you may have behaved like you weren't in the family, but you are in the family. At no point were you ever not a son. At no point, despite all your behaviors, were you ever outside of the realm of being my flesh and blood, of being my son. The robe was an identity marker. And it was just this affirmation of taking your cloak off and whatever maybe worldly cloak that they carried, whatever identification markers they had of families or work or, or of their lives, they said, I'm willing to lay it down to take on the identity of Jesus. I'm willing to lay it down to be a part of the family of God and, and pick up the cloak to clothe myself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we worship the Lord, we are reaffirming our thankfulness and our posture of giving our whole life, everything from our true identity to our life's purpose. Every time we engage in worship with the Lord in spirit and in truth, we are reaffirming our thankfulness and our gratitude and our posture of giving our whole life With that being said, worship has great value. And there's a lot more that's going on in worship than maybe we even think. There's a lot more that's expressed from our hearts. There's a lot more that God is engaging us in as we we offer worship in spirit and in truth. As we give these extravagant gifts and these, these displays because he really is worthy of it all. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning?